we've got a, wet, a guest standing in the in the in the sort of just off stage that we want to talk to because he's written himself another book. Yeah, why don't you introduce him, Don? You know uh, Pat Williams pretty well. Well, I was fortunate enough to to work with Pat with the Seventy Sixers before he went down and created the Orlando Magic, and I know we'll talk about the Orlando Magic as well because that was a very disappointing season, but. One thing we're going to talk about today, uh, right at the top, Pat's got himself a new book out. And, Pat, what is this, number 23, 24? What is it? <laughs> well, Don, actually it's number book number 75, if you can believe wow. it or not. But uh, it's out now. It's called Leadership Excellence. And I dig into the seven qualities that it takes to be a great leader. Uh, I had a wonderful time putting the book together. It really has, has kind of hinged off my speaking in the corporate world where there's a great fascination in leadership, and I speak about the seven sides of leadership. And so this book is an offshoot of that, and it's out and in bookstores now, and and hopefully it will make a difference in the life of every leader who reads it. Well, Pat, the one thing we need from the president on down, uh, regardless of party or affiliation, we need some type of dramatic leadership. Someone has to have the courage to make decisions, and, uh, and you're right on top of that. Well, Don, here, here's what I've written about. Uh, number one is vision, the ability to see out into the future and see the future before it gets here. That's the mark of a visionary leader. Number two, communicate your vision. It's one thing to have a vision, but you've got to be able to communicate it clearly and in a way that people will be stimulated and challenged. Number three, people skills. Great leaders have a heart for people. They care about people. They have empathy and love for people. Uh, number four, the fourth principle is character, still counts in leadership. And we've seen a huge breakdown in character with leaders, you know, in the political world, the church world, the sports world. I mean, education, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real issue, but character does still count in leadership. Then the fifth quality is called competence. Leaders are good at what they do. Uh, I don't think leaders are born. Well, they are born. I mean, every leader was born, but uh, they have to go and then be lifelong learners and really work hard at becoming more competent as a leader every day. And then the sixth quality, and you just mentioned it, Dot, it's called boldness. Uh, leaders have to make decisions. They are the decider. And uh, you're better off in an organization with a bold decision that doesn't work than no, no decision at all. And then the seventh side I write about is a serving heart. Uh, these are men and women who understand they're not in leadership positions to dominate people and crush them and browbeat them and maneuver and manipulate them, but they're there to serve. It, it's not about me. I mean, that's the mindset of great leaders. It's about you and this company that I'm leading, and uh, it's not about my resume and my advancement. It's, it's all about you. So that's the meat of the book, Don. It's out now in bookstores in the business section under leadership and up on uh, Amazon.com as well. Doug? Yeah, Pat, good, good to talk to you again. We just mentioned before we went on, uh, I think it was last November, we talked to you when you had the book on uh, on Bobby Bowden out. And, uh, yes, and obviously yes. sports has, uh, you know, so much to do, uh, you know, w w with leadership, uh, particularly in the, in the coaching ranks, but even players on, on the field or on the court. Uh, do you do a lot of interviews in this particular book uh, with uh, sports uh, people? Over the years I have, Doug, I've, I, whenever I'm with anybody, I – take notes, I, I try and pick their brains, I, I want to gather uh, everything I can from them, uh, whether we're at a dinner or sitting at lunch or passing in the airport, you know, I definitely want to get a, something from, from people that I admire and respect and that we can learn from and pass along uh, what they have learned about life. And in the case of Bobby Bowden's, that book, uh, I interviewed, gosh, well over 200 players that had worked for, had played for him, and other coaches that know him, and media types, and all. We had a great time putting that together, and I'm doing another one in that series. The first book we did was Bear Bryant on leadership, and then uh, Bobby Bowden on leadership, and the third book will be out this fall. It's called Tom Osborne on leadership. Oh, great! And 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 we take a look at the legendary Nebraska coach. I think that too. Uh, that there's also a. Uh, you have to be fortunate enough to be put in the right position, uh, not necessarily because you strive to be in that position, but you become a leader in a position that dictates it. 
as you said, maybe you're born to it, maybe you're fortunate enough to be there at that time. You know, was Winston Churchill fortunate enough to be where he was in 1940? Uh, that type of thing. Harry Truman, was, he, was Harry Truman fortunate enough to win the election? When you have to be at the right time and the right place to make some of these major, major decisions. John, I don't think there's any question that circumstances do play a role in, in becoming a legendary leader. You know, without Adolf Hitler, we, we wouldn't have had Churchill in that role. We wouldn't have had Eisenhower. Franklin Delano Roosevelt wouldn't be viewed as he is viewed, or, right. or Harry Truman. Uh, so there's no question uh, timing is, is, is a vital part of being a leader who will never be forgotten. Mr. Abraham Lincoln and George Washington would be included in that. So I, I think your point is a good one, that when circumstances, try dire circumstances, uh, I, I think leaders have a step, have a chance to step up and do things that they would never be able to do in peaceful times. So uh, that, to a large degree, that's why we remember them fondly or, 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 or with great admiration. I always thought, Pat, uh, I went to uh, uh, college up uh, in Long Island, the Delphi uh, Business School there, and I always thought there should be more emphasis, uh, maybe a course or two, uh, part of the curriculum, uh, leadership skills. Uh, I think business schools might do uh, a service to, to teach at least some of this as part of the curriculum. I, I don't know what you think about it, but it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Well, Doug, in our day, certainly in my day at Wake Forest and then later at Indiana University, uh, that, that, that was never subject material that came along the path. I, I no. wish it had as well. Today, that's different. Uh, many universities are emphasizing it. I I ran into uh, somebody this weekend. Yeah, I ran into some. Oh, yeah, it was um, Michael Lombardi's son at in Ocean City, Maryland, on Saturday night at dinner, and I asked what his major was at uh, the University of Delaware, and he said leadership. Mm. He, he said that's my major in the business school. I guess I guess it falls under in the management department, but he said I'm majoring in leadership, and I thought, my goodness, how awesome is that? That's so, right. It was uh, your it, book. It, Maybe, yeah, they could use my book as a textbook, Don. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they could use you your book, put it right in there. You, just a little Let's bit of for feel it. for a moment. Uh, Webb Simpson, uh, what a great story. You talked about Wake Forest a second ago, your school, and, of course, the tie between Arnold Palmer and uh, Webb Simpson and the scholarship and what happened at the United States Open at the Olympic course. Uh, what a great, great weekend, and, and what a great plug for Wake Forest University. Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah, it really is, Don. And Arnold Palmer triggered all that, I think. You know, he, he went to Wake Forest. Um, he's 10 years older than I am, so he would have been in the class of 52. So uh, he, <coughs> he arrived there in the late, in the late 40s and, uh, and, and really put Wake Forest golf on the map and, and has kept it there. You know, he's been very right. generous with scholarship help and lent his name to so many uh, – activities at Wake Forest. He's, he's never forgotten the school. And uh, so many outstanding golfers over the years who have come through Wake Forest. The most recent is, is uh, Tiger Woods' niece, uh, Cheyenne Woods, who has just gone on to the LPGA Tour this summer after graduation. So uh, Wake Forest has uh, got a great golf reputation. And, and Arnold is the key to that. Well, you talk about leadership, and there are two people that uh, have really stepped up in a leadership role. One would be Arnold Palmer, the other being Jack Nicklaus. Now, there are many others, but, I mean, uh, those two have certainly carried it forth uh, to the very top. Yeah, they put golf on the map, Don, and, uh, and, and uh, Jack is an Ohio State guy, and he, he's been extremely enthusiastic about his alma mater as well and has stayed close to that program. So when you when you think of the legends of golf, I mean, those two guys come to your mind immediately, from, right, right at the top. Great you take that, you take that uh, yeah. one step further away from right. the golf itself, and you look at what they've done for the hospitals, both in Florida, where uh, Nicholas mm -hmm. works there, he and his wife are very much a part of that, but also the hospitals in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, Arnold Palmer the same way uh, uh, in Tampa. Uh, it's not just their sporting uh, success that they've had. It's what they've been able to do for mankind in, that, in those areas. And, and Don, uh, Arnold is, is very involved here. We've got the Arnold Palmer Hospital, uh, the Winnie Palmer Children's Hospital 
you know, his, his, his ex-wife or his wife who died of cancer. And uh, so, the, so the Palmer name is all over these buildings and all over the medical uh, world here in Central Florida as well. I was going to say, Don and, and Pat, great documentary NBC had on over the weekend of uh, Jack and, and Arnold going back to the, the 1962 U.S. Open, uh, how they you know, competed against each other, and Jack won his first one. Very, very well done. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, I saw piece, I saw parts of it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's exciting stuff to go back to those legendary guys. It's really neat. When Pat, you mentioned that you were in Philadelphia over the weekend, of course, talking about the University of Delaware and Dallas Green and Lily Carpenter's great connection with the University of Delaware. And my uh, next to last granddaughter graduated from Delaware. I got three in the family that graduated from there, and the last one just graduated really? Saturday a week ago. And, How about uh, that? Yeah, and, and what a great connection down there in, in Delaware. But you also mentioned... You were in Philadelphia, so I know you learned a lot about sports this weekend that you haven't seen maybe for a year or so. Well, I came through. I spoke in Ocean City, New Jersey yesterday, uh, right off the boardwalk at a, at a church, uh, to the Tabernacle, which is a church Sunday church activity there. I had two really nice crowds. It was wonderful. Came through the Philly airport, and yes, Don, I got the Philly papers. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's nothing, like, nothing like reading the Philly papers, unless it's the New York papers. And uh, long articles on what the 76ers should do in the off season. Long articles on the plight of the Phillies. An in-depth interview with Ruben Amaro Jr. Uh, a whole rundown on the Phillies minor league players and what they're up to. And boy, good stuff. Good stuff if yeah. you're an old Philly sports fan. And uh, I, I, I was uh, I was interested in all of it. So the Phillies are struggling. Uh, uh, Eagles, uh, Don, and the other thing is Eagles stuff, I mean, front page, on and on and on and on, and they're, what, a month from training camp? Correct. But, Correct. but the, Eagles, yeah. the Eagles stuff never dies. Oh, my oh. goodness. So it, it was, uh, it was good, good to catch up on the Philly sports scene. Well, for folks that are listening right now that aren't real familiar with Pat other than his basketball, with, they said he really started out as a baseball guy. I mean, you were you were solidly enthralled in baseball before you got into the basketball, and of course, one of your sons is very much involved in it as well. And and so, uh, and deep in your heart, you got a little feeling for baseball. Well, I, Don, it was 50 years ago this month. I graduated from Wake Forest, where I'd been a catcher on our ACC championship team, and um, I uh, signed with the Phillies uh, right out of college. They gave me a $500 bonus and four hundred a money? month. <laughs> All that money, and, and off I went to Miami, uh, which was their farm club in the Florida State League. Arrived the same day as a young 18-year-old bonus baby named Ferguson Jenkins, and uh, we were teammates that summer and the next. And our manager both years was Andy Simonick, the old Phillies catcher. Right. And uh, boy, that and that was great. Alex Johnson, the for future American League batting champion, played center field for us, and so I got to ride the buses, Don, and, and got a real taste of of sports at the, at the grassroots level. It has stood me in good stead ever since. And then uh, 44 years ago this summer, Dr. Jack Ramsey called down to the little ballpark in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I was running the Phillies minor league team. And Dr. Jack said he needed somebody to run his front office. He was going to take on the coaching duties as well as being the GM. He had traded Wilt Chamberlain to the Lakers. Would I be interested? Wow. So t two visits to Philadelphia. I was 28 years old at the time, and I walked in. Uh, they, they, after the second visit, they offered me a three-year contract at 20000 a year. I thought I was the richest man in North America. <laughs> and, well, uh, I'll tell you the one thing and, I and remember. The next day, Go ahead. The next day <clears throat> Dr. Jack goes to training camp in Margate, New Jersey, and said, here it is. Here are the keys. Go run it. <laughs> wow! Wow! The one thing I the one thing I can tell people about uh, 1952 when you went down with the uh, Philadelphia Phillies to Miami, Florida, with Andy Semenik, he's the only guy I ever knew that would catch a pop fly behind home plate without taking his hat off. He hated he, he hated to take his hat off. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, had a bald he head, and he, he was unbelievable. He, if, he, if he threw the mask back and the hat came off, the first thing he worried about was picking the hat up. <laughs> yeah, he was bald as a billiard ball from the time, I guess, he was in his mid-20s, Don. Right. And, uh, and looked, like, looked like a big, thick, powerful Yule Brenner. Oh, uh, that, that, that's, that's the best way to describe Andy. I Tough as a cob, and 
What, what a guy. Agree with never, I never will forget Andy Semenek. Could not agree with you more. But, hey, we have to talk a little bit about your, your closer ties, and that's the team right there in Tampa. The Magic uh, went through a lot of, you talk about the Sixers in turmoil when you were there. Well, there was a lot of turmoil this year with the Magic. Well, it was a tum- I guess tumultuous is the word, Don. We uh, first of all the long lockout and uh, the, the no, no start until Christmas, and you know that was difficult for every team. Uh, I think particularly so with us. Uh, then the whole question about Dwight Howard's contract: uh, Will he stay? Will he go? Uh, then then this um, these reported difficulties between uh, Dwight and Stan Van Gundy. Uh, then Stan Van Gundy's April press conference in which he said that um, he had gotten it on good word that Dwight wanted him fired, and oh boy, it went on. And then Dwight's back surgery. Uh, the only good positive in there through all of that was that Dwight did sign an extension uh, for next year. So we've got him under contract for another season. Uh, he's been rehabbing his back, and you know all the, all the indications are he's doing very well. And uh, but now we have a, a GM slot open and a coaching slot open. Uh, we've got to resolve the Dwight Howard situation at some point. Uh, the draft is coming up in about ten days. So my goodness, you talk about a busy off season. We 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 got a lot going on over here. No question, I know. No question about that. And the other thing was, I heard you do a, a rather lengthy interview right around the time that uh, all the difficulties started, would he sign, would he extend, what would he do? And I had to agree 100% with your comment. I forget uh, whether it was on ESPN or uh, where it was a live uh, broadcast you did, and you said the most difficult part about trading a superstar is you never really get the value for the player you're trading. And I, I agree with you 100%. I think it's the toughest thing in the world. I mean, I saw Will trade it. I saw, you know, I've seen a million big-time trades, but holy cow, do you ever get your money's worth? Yeah, you go back and check the two Wilt trades, and then the the uh, Oscar Robertson trade, the uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar trade, uh, the Charles Barkley trade. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, Don. Most of those great players finish their career in, in, with one team in, in many cases. But uh, when you do have to trade one for whatever reasons, and it's not skill reasons, it's always something else. Right, and uh, it, it's 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 all but impossible to come up with a trade that really works for you. So uh, you want to hang on to your great players as, as, if, if at all possible. Yeah, Pat, what 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 is the process of? Uh, I always thought it was kind of interesting. They always say, "What's the process of, of, of hiring a new coach?" You know, Charlotte's going through that now with with the Bobcats. Uh, I'm mean, obviously without naming names, but what, what what's the first thing you do, or, or what's the first step you take? Well, in our case, the first step is to hire a GM, and Alex Martins, our uh, CEO and president, has got that on his table. He's interviewed uh, numbers of candidates, and at some point uh, we'll come up with the guy that he likes the most, take him to visit our owners in Michigan and, you know, and get that nailed down. Then that GM has got to go to work on the coach. You don't want to hire the coach before the GM. Right. Uh, those two guys have got to be compatible. Uh, so the new GM has his his job of uh, figuring out who the right coach is. Uh, then free agency hits on July 1, and uh, you've got to be alert to that and on top of all of that. And, and then in our case, uh, building a bridge to Dwight Howard, uh, finding out what's on his mind. He knows how we feel, and uh, we, we've got to make sure that we know what he's thinking about. Uh, because we, we would like to get a long-term commitment from him. So uh, the new GM is going to have uh, an absolute hectic summer for the ages, really. That's the one a- coach I never thought really got uh, the notability he should have gotten was Alex Hannon. I, I thought Alex Hannon was just a, a outstanding coach and uh, really do how a uh, uh, number of stores that you're certainly well familiar with, but really do how to get the best out of the players he had. And, and Don, he, he coached one of the great teams of all time, maybe right. one of the five greatest teams of all time, that 76er team of 1967 with Wills and Billy Cunningham and Al Greer, Chet Walker, who's going into the Hall of Fame this fall. Um, and you got four Hall of Famers right there in, in Wilt, Chet, Billy, and, uh, and Hal Greer. I mean, a remarkable group. And, and Alex Hannum, those old players swear by him. 
you know, you talk to Chet Walker or Billy or any of the many of who played for him, right. uh, they have nothing but good things to say about Alex. He was big, he was tough, he, but yet he could relate to them individually. I uh, wasn't afraid to go out and have a beer with him, as Chet Walker said, <laughs> and, uh, you know, was a very special human being. Passed away too soon, but uh, one, one of the great coaches in this league of all time. Well, I have to agree with you 100%. And the, the funny thing was that, uh, you know, it could never happen today. I mean, this is a new world for, uh, you know, so much visible. Uh, he'd come in the locker room after, the after you know, a game, and he'd sit down with you in the, or in the press room and, and pour himself out a shot and a beer, and he'd sit there and talk to you. And, I mean, he, he was just a, a regular guy. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and as you said, Don, that would never happen today in this in this modern era. It just, no. you know, that 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 coach would be on a plane somewhere right after the game, and you know, or or go off somewhere. But uh, Alex just loved to talk about the game and very loquacious. He was a good guy, unbelievable guy. Well, fits right in with your leadership book, and uh, we we give that a little plug again, Doug. How about if you touch on uh, on that and where it's available? Yeah, leadership excellence is the name of the book. The seven sides of leadership for the twenty first. A century and uh, Don, uh, between you and me, I don't think we've read 75 books in our life. Pat's written 75. <laughs> well, I hope I'm close to it. I, I think I got a few more than 75, but yeah, I'm I reading think I it. Said this too. That, that's quite. Uh, do you have a particular time of day or, or that you write, Pat? I mean, that's that's very prolific. Do you set aside a I couple hours the, a day, or I think in the flow of life, you know, I gather stories and anecdotes from my reading, from my. Uh, you know my own experience with people's, uh, and I, I I keep them filed <clears throat> by category. Right. And so when it's time to write the book, in most cases, you know my heavy research is done, and uh, you know it, over 40 years, it's amazing, you know what kind of material you can stack up, and uh, I learned that very early as I had speaking and writing opportunities that uh, stories sell. Um, Famous names sell, and, and and you want every page to kind of crackle with some interesting stuff, you know, that people are going to gravitate to. So that that's that's my theory of writing books, and so far so good. You know, I've got well, I've got eight, I've got five more books coming in the next year and a half. So holy I uh, I continue wow. to keep plowing away here. Well, I'm reading one right now that's one of the best I've read in a long time, which is Unbroken. I don't know if you had a chance to read that. Oh, yeah, Laura, Laura Hildebrand's book. Yeah, she's oh, amazing. Oh, my gosh, job. when you talk about leadership, holy, it's one of the, I think it's one of the best books I've ever read, to tell you the truth. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, she's had tremendous success, and that book continues on the bestseller list. So, Oh, no you're, question you're about it. You're reading Thanks. a good one, Don. Yeah, she went from Secretariat to, to Unbroken, and uh, so uh, she's, she really has a feel for, you know, human beings and what's going on, and it was wonderful. But I'll tell you, leadership is uh, you, you look for it, you hope for it, uh, uh, you, you hope it's going to, as you said, in the political field, in the business field, you hope that the people uh, that are put into these leadership roles take advantage of it and don't, you know, don't abuse it, and that's what's been happening. Well, I'm, I'm glad to visit with both of you and uh, always happy to join you, and feel free to call any time. And uh, hang in there and keep broadcasting. Well, Don, your voice sounds good. My goodness, you're amazing. 78. So far, so good. I, I'm still climbing, though. We'll see what happens. <laughs> nice to be with you, Pat, and thank you thank so you, much for your time. We'll have you on thank the you, phone. Gentlemen. Okay. And people thank can you, always hit my website. It's patwilliamsmotivate.com. You got Pat, it. Glad you feel thank about you, guys. Too. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.